A stunning voice sings loud and proud over the reed beds. An exciting visitor. A rare springtime vocal heard and spotted here at Wild Ken Hill. Perhaps it's come to reserve its front row seat for the delights, the insights, the beauty and the seasonal parental duty on tonight's Spring Watch. And welcome to day two, week two of Spring Watch 2020, coming to you from Wild Ken Hill on the northwest coast of Norfolk. And yesterday we off to a cracking start. Jack Smith, PhD student at Cambridge, sent us that footage of those burying beetles regurgitating meat to their young. Oh, oh what? so oh. good, so so good. But then, of course, we followed that with, for the first time ever. European badgers giving birth, thanks to Kate McRae. Can I on. say something else? This what? is a oh as well. It's the fact that the sun's come out. We've got blue sky. We Spring do is have here. some blue sky. And on that account, we can go straight to our live camera because we think that we've got Marsh Harrier out oh. hunting. Look, Look at, at that. that. It's a male quartering over the fields, Michaela, where some of our breeding birds have young. Things like... Oyster catcher, lapwing. Oh no, stop Ooh, it, stop look at it. it. Let's keep a close eye on the marsh harrier. It's got hungry chicks in its nest, of course. And the nest is down in the reed beds, which is where that bird we opened with has been singing, the great reed warbler. Now, great reed warblers typically live further south in Europe, France, Spain, of course the rest of Europe and in parts of North Africa too. We get about four of them a year here. We've had 18 in the last 20 years, so quite special to see that. Let's have another look at it. We can contrast it with our typical reed warbler there on the left. It's a much smaller, dowdier bird. The great reed warbler's thrush size, it's got a much bigger bill. When it opens its mouth, it's got a massive orange gape and it pumps out a very loud song. It's about double the size, 36 grams, reed warbler around 15 or 16. Question is of course, if it's over here singing, it's looking for a mate, is there any chance of them breeding? Well there are no records of them breeding and very sadly in recent years they've declined by 37% in Europe so the chances of them hopping over the channel and starting to colonise here are sadly not that great but keep your eyes peeled you can't miss them i went to see one once at fleet pond years ago i arrived on my own and i was asking another bird he said just look for the bird with the massive orange gob <laughs> and when they open their mouth they do indeed have a massive orange gob <laughs> it's not the only rare visitor though i mean that's a lovely bird song wise but a bit brown for me do you want something a bit flashier what about a bee eater the bee eater was seen here in norfolk and on sunday we sent our cameraman down and he got a little glimpse of it i say a little glimpse because it was raining <laughs> and it was a bit dull and you can't really see those beautiful colors normally south europe west asia north africa but there's about 75 of them seen a year so you'd get extremely excited to see one. I'm not sure it's too happy to be here, though. I don't think it's happy arrived on a, on a pretty average see rainy that blackbird. spring day. That blackbird, blackbird got up there and started singing, saying, this is what it's like in the UK. Welcome to Britain. That's what it was saying. The bee eater, on the other hand, is thinking, I wish they hadn't cancelled my flights back to southern Spain, because that's where it would much rather be. It was also thinking, I think I've made the wrong life choice here. Very but much. let me just show you the colours, because it really is a stunning bird. I mean, look, it's the sort of bird that you think someone's thrown a paint load of paint at you know a kid yeah. has just thrown paint at that bird too many felt tips no i absolutely love them stunning stunning bird and if you do go for gaudy overcolored birds what about this one this is a roller spotted in cornwall photographed by ali and chris wright now these are far less frequent visitors to the uk we normally get about two of these uh, a year are they going to colonize like some of these vagrants have in recent times unlikely i fear because they do feed on large insects when they're breeding and sadly most of our large insects have disappeared Lots of colourful birds. What about a secretive bird? I mean, this really would be a good spot. It's a little bitten, and this was spotted in the Isles of Scilly on Saturday. 
only four per year seen in the UK, but they are very secretive birds, as I say. 2009, though, confirmed breeding Avalon marshes in Somerset. So that is an excellent spot, isn't it? It is, and they continued after 2009 to breed there for several years. I think they may have disappeared now. But I say disappeared, they are so tricky to spot. They could be almost anywhere, uh, li quite literally. Quite you know, literally, they could anywhere. Be almost anywhere. And if they do, if you're in a reed bed, they, they come up, they fly about 15 metres, and then they drop straight back down again. And you blink and think, oh, did I just see a little bittern? So they could be here, there's no doubt about that. And they are one of those species which are more likely to be colonising, following the in the footsteps of a number of heron and egret species which have hopped over the channel and started to breed here. Things like great egret, uh, purple heron, of course, uh, and cat egret as well. Well, those are the rare visitors, but let's take a look at our regular breeders that are here because we've got cameras on plenty of them. Fine selection of birds there. And I'm going to start by talking about the oyster catcher, which we saw yesterday. It had two eggs. Unfortunately, the first egg got protated by a little owl. The second chick hatched and we left it last night on the show by the nest with the adults. So what's happened since? Well, this is the nest. No birds there. Don't panic. Don't panic. It's a, it's a happy story because this is what we saw at 8.15 last night. There's the adult with the chick and we'd expect it to wander off. It's precocial. Eventually it did wander off into the reeds and the marshes. The adults shortly followed it. And so I think we can sum that up and say it was a Pretty happy ending. What do you reckon, Chris? I don't know. Let's ask that marsh harrier that's hunting over oh, there no, at the moment it. whether it's a happy stop ending it. or not. All of the birds which are out on those flat plains um, have trouble with their, their youngsters looking after them. Another species that we've been looking at nesting there was the lapwing, had a clutch of four eggs. We saw all of them hatched and they are all still out there. They're remarkably well camouflaged and the adults are doing a really good job of looking after them. What's this? A stone curlew. Not a predator of lapwing chicks, but the female lapwing is so neurotic when it comes to protecting her young that even the weird cry of the stone curlew stimulates her into action and she immediately flies off to chase it out of her territory. Gives us a great chance to look at the plumage of that stone curlew. An even rarer wader out on our farmland this pair have failed, but they're trying to re-nest. And eventually they manage to find a little spot which is not going to upset the lapwings too much. And then what we see is that the male stone curlew starts to pull some of its amazing displays. Here it is, look at this. Drawing itself in tight, tail goes down, head goes up, it's pretty weird. And then it steps towards the female she is prepared, he hops on her back, waggles his tail, presents his cloaca to hers, and at just after eight o'clock on BBC Two, you've got avian copulation. <laughs> and that's what you pay your licence fee for. <laughs> now, I'll tell you what people pay their licence fee for, well, is for you to do a bit of Strictly Come Courting. So as we walk over to the map, I want you to pretend you're a male stone curly. So come on. OK. Okay. Well, hold on, no, yeah, hold on. Yeah. First of all, I've got to do my sort of get, you know, what's slumping along, and then yeah, I go yeah. into like that, yeah. and I go really bug eyed <laughs> yeah, like that, and then I do like silly little way. steps like that, <laughs> all the way over here. <laughs> Did I impress you? No, not in the slightest. Good, because it wasn't going to go any side. further than that. I wasn't lifting my tail for any <laughs> <Yeah>. reason. <laughs> Stay that side of the map. We're at our map because we can see this fantastic selection of nests that we've got, and we've got another nest to put on. It's the nest of a black cat. So let's have a look at that live. I love this nest. Here we go. There's the, oh look. Now I say black cat, that's the female. The female has a chestnut cap. And every time you look at this nest, one of the adults is on it looking absolutely gorgeous. This is the story so far of the black cats. There were four eggs in the nest and all four chicks successfully hatched. Now the parents have done a fantastic job. We in fact labelled them the power couple because both of them came in giving regular feeds. Both were brooding. In fact, we counted 34 feeds in one hour. 
and that's an average between fees of 1.8 minutes. So these parents are working extremely hard and bringing in a variety of food for those hungry chicks. So all was going very well and it was all a pretty picture until Sunday when we had that rain, the temperatures dropped and unfortunately one of the chicks succumbed to the weather and on Monday morning we saw the adult pick it up out of the nest and fly off with it. That left the three though and I'm pleased to tell you that the three continued to do very well and that power couple continue to feed them. And there you've got the male and the female. You can very clearly see the difference. I, I, I just really love that nest. It's a really pleasant nest to Very watch. picturesque. Yeah. Very picturesque. Now, as I said at the top of the program, we started strong yesterday with those burying beetles and the birth of the badgers. But tonight, we've got another world first for you. Yes, with news of a new species for science and your opportunity to get involved. I hand over to Beaster up there on the Northumberland coast. Megs, take it away. Hello. Oh, I can't tell you how excited I am. I've been waiting and waiting for this news and I can't tell you how brilliant it is. Now, of course, I am in Hawksley on the Northumberland coast and it's a beautiful sight. But for now, I need to take your mind back to January when I was doing Winter Watch at WWT's Castle Espy. Now, one of their volunteers, Johnny Clark, went into an old disused gun powder shed and he noted something a little bit bizarre. And well, it caught all of our attention immediately. Here we've got a cave spider and it lives in this kind of microclimate within this gunpowder store. It's a beautiful spider, but look what happens. This is a fungus. And looking closely, what you can see is the spider's arm surrounded by spores of fungus. So what is going on? Well, I'm going to remind you a little bit of the biology and here I have my prop. So essentially what happens is the spores of the fungus make their way through the cephalothorax, which is the head and thorax here, and the abdomen. In the soft bits between the exoskeleton, so between the arms, between these joints here the spores work their way inside the body and using chemicals it takes over the brain it parasitizes the spider forcing it to travel upwards and as it does so it basically causes a soup inside the spider turning it into mulch before taking all the nutrients out and all the fungus arms come around it and then the spores are released back down the cave again to infect another spider. It's a parasitizing mush, um, parasitizing fungus, but how cool is that? Absolutely remarkable. But we thought it might be a new species. We weren't entirely sure. So we sent it off to Dr. Harry Evans from CAB International so he could work out what was going on. And he put it in a Petri dish and did all of his wonderful scientific things to figure out if it possibly could be. Now, this is it in the Petri dish finding out all of that useful information. So what I am pleased to say is that Harry sent us a, a tree, a diagram of all the genetics, and we can see where our fungus species fits in. Now it belongs to the genus Gibalula, and what you can see here is you follow this branch, this is a common ancestor here, we follow it down to this clade. And this is our species in purple, and it's closest to relatives. But interestingly, the two relatives live in Asia, namely Thailand. So how did our Gibalula species come to the UK? Could it be a case of convergent evolution, the fact that we had a tropical climate before the Ice Age? Could it be that some gunpowder was imported into that store and somehow it managed to hitch a ride and disperse that way? Well, to be honest, we have got no idea whatsoever and it's going to be used for in really important research because within the fungus when it's inside that spider it's full of really important antibodies to make sure that whilst the spider's immune system is low because the fungus is inside it that nothing else can get in and infect it but those antibodies could be used for antibiotics and this store of our gibalula is even going to be stored next to the very first fungus that we found penicillin in so it could have massive implications for medicine going forward but we need your help we don't have a name for this fungus yet we know it has to be Gibalula, but the next name we're not entirely sure and we would really really love your help and suggestions so if you would like to help us name this 
really cool fungus, please send in to our social media using the hashtag SpringWatchFungus on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook. We will release the results and we will tell you the name of the fungus on Thursday's show at the end of the week. For me personally, and I think the pheasant over there agrees, I'm thinking Jibalula Clark, named after the volunteer that first found the fungus, which would be pretty cool. How great is that? I mean, seriously, very cool. But let's go over to Yolo, in north of me on the Isle of Mull. Yolo, have you got any ideas for this fungus name? Well, do you know what, Megs? I've given this uh, an awful lot of thought, and I did think uh, Chris has had a lot of things named after him, I would imagine. Pacamiae hasn't quite the, got the ring to it, has it? Strachaniae, after Michaela. Now, that is sounds more scientific. Williamsiae sounds too common, and I suspect it doesn't matter what I say. It'll end up being something like Boaty McBoat fungus or something like that. We'll see. Anyway, I'm up here on the beautiful Isle of Mull on the west coast of Scotland. And it's been unbroken sunshine here for a week and a half. Isn't that incredible? Not so for the rest of the country, but it's been beautiful up here. And Mull is stunning. We're talking about 480 kilometres, 300 miles of stunning coastline. And it's a rich coastline too, full of small fish, full of crabs, ideal for otters. And we have some of the highest densities of breeding otters here on Mull, higher than almost anywhere else in the whole of the UK. Now, over the weekend, I went out with a keen young local naturalist called Murdo. Murdo loves his wildlife and he's been putting camera traps out to monitor his local otters. So I thought, I know, let's tap into this local knowledge. And we went out to try and find and watch a wild otter. So, have, have you always been into wildlife since you were young? Yeah, pretty much. Have you? I saw my first adder when I was three. Did you? Yeah, I yeah. found it. That um, is pretty cool. I, I didn't see, can't, can't actually remember my first adder, but I, I was older than three, I know that. So, do you often go out looking for otters? Uh, yeah, I've set up a few camera traps and stuff for them. So what have you got? Have you got a female? Have you got a female with cubs or what have you got there? I think it's a female with a cub. How oh, is it? I think it's just, we've only seen a singular cub, but... What, what do you usually do when you go out looking? Do you just walk along looking for signs? Yeah, sprints and um, like patches of ground that have gone greener than the rest. Ah, oh, wow. And, and that's because of all the sprints on it, yeah. is it? When there's a po where there's like a, a point that comes out, they'll usually sprint there because it'll, the scent will travel further. Oh, that's pretty cool. Well, fair play to you. That's a good way to pin them down. I can't see any otters, Muro. Can, can you see anything at all? Um, not really. Any so birds out there? The, the herons out there. Oh, yeah, yeah, I see the heron. Yeah, that'd be a good place, I think, wouldn't it? If we climb up here, yeah. tuck ourselves in, we should be able to see everything then from here. I'll tuck in here, you tuck in there. It's a bit of there. What have we got? Oh, wow, yeah, 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 yeah. Otter sprint. Look at this. But I tell you what, you are right, because they've sprinted here so much over the years. Grass has grown here on this little patch. Right. I still think if we're going to get an otter anyway, I think you're right. It's going to be around this headland, little headland here, I think. So you keep your eyes open. Your eyes are so much better than mine. Right, can you see it? No, it's come back in the water. Is it? Yeah. So the, the otter's been coming up with food, like mainly um, butterfish, and then he'll lie on his back and he'll eat it, and then he'll go back down and get more. You told me you'd find me an otter and to track it down for me, and you have done. Top man. Well done, you. Well done, Major. Do you know what? That was a lovely afternoon. What I learned most, I think, was how to watch otters responsibly. What do I mean for that? Well, just a few key things for you. First of all, where's the wind coming from? Is the wind coming from behind you towards the otter? They have a keen sense of smell, so the otter is going to know that you're there. If you're walking and the otter's fishing, well, wait for the otter to dive down for food. Then you can move. When the otter comes back up, you stop. Are you talking loudly? Are you making too much noise? Are you moving too quickly? Also, critically, 
and this is true not just for the otter but for all wildlife give the animal plenty of room give it plenty of space our long lens wildlife cameraman followed all of those rules over the weekend and he got some stunning footage of the otter now this otter had been fishing had come ashore to rest up on the seaweed actually came out towards the cameraman but the cameraman was tucked in between two rocks about 40 meters away with his long lens that was quite close enough and otters will do this when they've been feeding they'll come ashore they'll dry out it'll help in digestion but look every now and again they stop to look up they're always alert they're looking any strange smells any strange movements anything different eventually slowly made its way back into the water that otter is acting naturally it's gone back in to start fishing all over again and do you know what murder was right it kept coming back up with butterfish constantly that's all it had butterfish after butterfish after butterfish plenty of food there for the otter so please by all means do come up to mull it's a wonderful place but please respect the wildlife and also respect the people who live and work here too. Now another young man who's passionate about his wildlife is Robert up in Kendal. So much so that he spent most of his spare time now creating homes for one of our most threatened mammals. It isn't the dawn chorus ringing out over Kendal in the Lake District but the sound of 17-year-old Robert hard at work. Yeah, that'll do, bro. With his father Mark on hand for heavy lifting. I'm making a hedgehog house. Now, we've had a number of different designs. You just know that something you've done is helping something else. It makes you mood better. Working on the homes hasn't just helped hedgehogs, as Robert has also been working on himself. Robert has special educational needs. Specifically, he he's, has autism um, and some learning disabilities, um, which weren't diagnosed until yeah, only, a, only a few years ago. And I think because he was, you know, he was a little bit different, he was really, really badly bullied. Um, and that knocked his confidence and had a massive impact on his well-being. I sort of, sort of went downhill and then got... It took four years to get over it and then not get over it, to deal with it. In that time, I got my diagnosis of autism. It didn't change who I was, but it meant other people understood more me than before, so it, yeah, helped. Robert has always had a love for wildlife. Uh, yeah, I can see it. When his family took on a plot at the nearby allotment, it changed his life. We took on the allotment, which was a, a safe space for him, a different place to be outside, getting his hands dirty and, and building things. I've always been into like wildlife and conservation. I'd already spotted this, it's about two metres by four metres area, which I was like, if we get, I'm having that and I'll turn it into a wildlife area. First, I just had a path through with some flowers. And then I got the idea of a pond. It was quite amazing how quickly, you know, we, we got pond skaters, diving beetles, and then last summer we got frog spawn and we, we got some frogs as well. My mum has said as well about possibly making a hedgehog house. I researched into facts and came up with an idea of creating a sort of a state of hedgehog houses on our allotment. Gardens and allotments have become ever more important for the UK's only spiny mammal, as their populations have crashed nationwide. Thank you. But Robert's hedgehog estate is offering refuge for some at least, and he's adding to it all the time. They come fully furnished, 
and he's put a lot of thought into the fixtures and fittings. We have about 13 to 15 hedgehog houses on the allotment. Tunnel keeps predators from getting their paw in and trying to grab it out. And then the roof, it's got this bitumen corrugated sheet on, so it protects the house's life. It also protects hedgehogs, it keeps rainwater off the top. And of course, every good estate needs a good neighbourhood watch. We monitor them via truck camera. Uh, see what we got. Yep. There's two of them. Well, they're both trying to get into the feeding station. Don't think that's really going to work. No. It was designed for one, not two. It's resilient, I give it that. Building the hedgehog houses has also changed what Robert would like to do in the future. It's got him developing skills and it's actually unearthed something he's got a real passion for that um, you know he wants to make a career out of in terms of, sort of yeah, joinery and woodwork. And he's also been lucky enough to be offered a college course um, to do architectural joinery from September. It's helped build his confidence as well. It's got him talking to the other allotment holders, some of the local vets and other places to sort of site some hedgehog houses. So it's been, you know, it's been a great outcome for Robert. And of course, a great outcome for the hedgehogs too. Most of allotments in Kendall, I eventually want to have some, not even if it's only just one, just some sort of refuge for a hedgehog. They were here first, and it's nice to give something back. What a great film. Really good to see Robert regaining his confidence, and it just shows to show how important that diagnosis is for some people. And we should change the way that we organise those diagnoses to make sure that they're more available to more people more quickly, to be quite honest with you, because you can see the transformation that it can make. It's fantastic, isn't it, that he found an interest and he's taking that forward with his carpentry. Exactly, really exactly. All about confidence, I think. Do you want to see a red deer? Because apparently we've just seen one on our long lens camera. Go on, man. Just on the edge of the poppy field. So this was seen live just before you came back to us. And there we go. And I think it's... Oh, look at that. It's gorgeous. Oh, it's Poppies got a calf. Out. It's got it... Oh, that looks little, doesn't at it? At the back. That's apps. Oh, and it's giving us a nice look. Absolutely gorgeous. Well, from red deer to red kites. <laughs> Shall we catch up with them? Let's have a look at them live at the moment. We haven't seen them for a couple of days. These are our two chicks sitting in the nest, 36 days old. They fledged at about 48, 50 days, so we might see them branching, although I don't think by the end of the series we'll see them fledging. Now, we've been looking at the chicks, but what about the nest? Because we know that they're scavengers, not just with their food, but with what they put in their nest as well. We've seen this before, but this year, in fashion in the kite's nest, uh, bits of plastic, blanket, carpets, all sorts of material is going into that nest. You know, this nest is typically large, it's untidy, but it's often decorated with these, well, quite frankly, bits of bling. And we think it's purely for decoration. Not sure I'd want all that rubbish in my bed, thank you very much, but kite seems to like it. Tracy Emin wouldn't mind. <laughs> However, let's take a look at our buzzards. We can go to them live now because they again have been bringing in lots of material. Oh, Mick, look at that. Look at how their feathers have come through. Oh, they look completely you turn you different, back for a don't day. they? Look how much down has disappeared, and now you can see the buzzard coloration coming through really, really quickly. But look, what I was about to say is that the buzzards too bring lots of material to the nest throughout the course of the incubation, brooding and fledging process, and you can see it there. It's all of that greenery that they've brought in. They continually add that greenery throughout the course of that process. What's it about? Well, there are a number of theories. Some people think it's about getting rid of parasites. Some people think it's about mate choice because the males bring greenery in and that might make it more appealing for the female. The third theory is that it offers some form of assistance to the developing young in terms of their immune system. Let's delve further. Over here, 
we've got a buzzard's nest that we made earlier and you can see that we've already added some of this material to it and I'm just going to be an adult female buzzard here now <laughs> and I'm going to bring some sweet chestnut and that's what we've seen them bring into this nest and that's quite unusual because normally when it comes to raptors we see them bringing in resinous material things like conifers like this because we know that inside those resins there is a whole load of really important compounds. And I'm going to list them here. They're antimicrobial, they're antioxidant, they're anti-inflammatory, they're anti-hepatotoxic, they're anti-diarrheal, they're antiviral, anti-ulcer, anti-allergenic and also vasodilatory. So those compounds are all within these types of plant, offering a potential assistance to either the adults or the young whilst they're in the nest. Yeah, well, I mean, we've seen it, haven't we, with, with the buzzards here. We've seen them bring in all of that different material. And you can see it here. Here they are, bringing in that material. They constantly replenish it. We don't only see this in buzzards, we see it in other raptors too. Goshawks in particular bring in lots of those types of plants. Young don't seem too keen on having it put in amongst them there. It seems that sweet chestnut and pine is the favourite in this particular nest, but there really is a lot of leafy foliage there. It's a great shot, that though, isn't it? Look, <laughs> she's trying to squeeze that in between them all. Yeah, and whilst we see birds of prey like this bring in lots of pine and well, a, bit, a bit of sweet chestnut, what we see small birds bring in is more herbaceous plants, smaller plants. And it's interesting as well because it, the benefits of green foliage has been studied much more in small birds. Now, we haven't been lucky enough to have blue tits in the last couple of years on this side, but if we look at this nest box, we'll see that it is very green. And the sort of things that they actively choose are aromatic plants, things like curry plant, you can see it bringing in mint, lavender, those really smelly plants. I mean, here we go. Here's some lavender. Give it a smell. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they are. They're, they're very aromatic. And studies have shown that these aromatic plants seem to reduce the bacteria not only in the nest, but in the chick with the chicks as well. And that helps them with their growth, helps them with their development of the feathers and generally helps them to get through to fledging. Much better success rate. And this sort of behaviour we see in quite a lot of cavity nesting birds. I suppose it makes sense because if you're going to bring something which has an olfactory value to it and it's contained in a cavity it might work better than if it were in the open. And another cavity nesting species that we see this in is the starling. Here's a starling bringing some greenery in, but this is a different story. It's been quite well studied. Only the male starlings bring in the greenery. And the peak of this activity is between the laying of the first eggs and the end of courtship. And they place the greenery in the nest in very prominent places. It's clearly there to impress the female. But does it play another role? Well, it appears that it does. In 2018, some science was done, which suggested that those nests which had more greenery saw the females staying in that nest longer when they were incubating for longer periods. And also, the temperature of those eggs was more consistently high. So the development of the young inside the eggs was more rapid and they came out to be fitter. So clearly, these leaves are affecting the behaviour of the incubating female starling. Now, the favourite plant for the starlings is something called milfoil, and this has a sedative quality. So it could be, more research required, that the males are putting in this sedative plant to calm the females down, so they incubate for longer periods, generate more heat in the eggs, and that leads to a greater fitness in the nest because more of them hatch and survive. That's, I need some of that. What was it called again? Because to calm, yeah, I need some of that to calm me down. Okay, you need a bale of that, that frankly. I'll tell, I'll tell you what Megs needed last week. She needed something natural to stop those midges. And Megs, I've heard that what you need is lemongrass, citronella and geranium. Mix it together, it'll keep the midges away. Thanks, Michaela. I'll know that for next time. When the midges are around, I'll certainly use that remedy and hopefully they'll stay back. But 
here in Hawksley, I'm pleased to say it's by the coast and therefore there aren't many midges. Now, many of us, of course, throughout the UK absolutely adore our garden birds and over half of us feed them and encourage them in one way or another. And that helps to help monitor certain populations, but also to give them a bit of a boost of energy when they're going through the breeding season, which is, of course, very energetically expensive. And here in Hawksley, we have been watching some amazing action on our bird feeder. There's been lots of characters coming in and out. Here we go, we've got a great tit there. How beautiful is that? Weighing the seed, having a look. Does it fancy anything? Popping down. Oh, it's brilliant. But there's also been lots of bullfinches and things. But the one species I was really excited about is the tree sparrow. A species incredibly rare and in decline. We've lost 93% since the 1970s. And it's, of course, red listed because of that. And you can tell the difference between our tree sparrow here and the house sparrow because tree sparrows are a little bit smaller. And they've got that black cheek and of course that beautiful red chestnut crown. But what's really sad is of course that compared to the 70s numbers is that actually for every one tree sparrow we see today, there should be 20 more. And whilst we're seeing particularly in areas across Northumberland, there is a slight increase. It's still of course nowhere near the numbers that it historically was. But that isn't the only species of concern that we've been seeing on our bird feeders. We've also been getting great views of red squirrels. We know red squirrels have declined by about 60% in the last 13 years. And it's such a shame, obviously outcompeted by the greys, but look how beautiful those beady eyes and beautiful whiskers. Now, lots of us do like to feed red squirrels if we're lucky enough to have them in our garden. And these feeders are great. They've got a lid on, which makes them perfect for red squirrels. And you can feed them things like hazelnuts with shells on, sunflower seeds, plain peanuts, pine nuts, perhaps, and even a few beech nuts. They are absolutely gorgeous. And no wonder they're one of the nation's favorite mammals. And sometimes we see them in interesting situations. To get to food, they will swim. And here in Hawksley, we do see red squirrels swimming across the water towards the lake. A bit of an unusual sight, because typically, of course, we see them swinging from the treetops. They're an arboreal species. So they're so mobile in what they do, getting from A to B. Look at how this individual scales down this vertical tree. How it's using its feet and its tail pressed against the tree so it can come down safely. And here jumping as they do best. They can jump six foot, but look, back legs positioned, front legs for force, pounces off, back legs come in. How wonderful to see. <laughs> a bit of a mistake there but an absolutely gorgeous animal. But you've got to pay close attention to where it's positioning its feet because essentially what it does is it can maneuver its body within the air and make sure its feet are vertical so that when it lands on a vertical surface like a tree trunk or a branch, it is ready to grip. And it does that through these really cool feet. Now here I've got a red squirrel foot for you. And what you can see, these are fatty patches all over here and really long tendons and this enables them to grip the branches really well um, and also enables them to move well because they've got a really flexible ankle and wrist joint enables them to be those air acrobatics and of course we're learning more from nature all the time something called biomimicry you know velcro we got from burr seeds we know about trains from a kingfisher head and now we're even studying squirrels to improve our robotics which to me is quite fascinating modern technology it never ceases to amaze me and blow our minds when it comes to the natural world. Now, as human beings, we're of course limited, limited to our own senses, vision, our sense of sight, our sense of smell, our sense of hearing. Sometimes we have to go beyond our own parameters, experience the world of something different and try and imagine what life is like with their senses. And for me, there's nothing more wonderful than the cuttlefish. Every year in springtime, as the sea begins to warm, the waters around the south coast of the UK welcome some very special visitors. They're one of our most sophisticated cephalopods, often referred to as the chameleons of the sea. Common cuttlefish. They're normally hidden from view, living deep in the English Channel. But in spring, they head to the shallows of the south coast to breed.
they might look flamboyant, but these cuttlefish are actually masters of disguise. By using special ink-filled cells in their skin called chromatophores, they're able to change colour and even texture to blend seamlessly into their surroundings. But when it comes to mating, the aim of the game is to stand out as much as possible. Both sexes can display these zebra stripes, but the larger males intensify them when wooing a female and fending off rivals. These males have each secured a female and they're guarding them fiercely. A dark face is a clear sign of aggression and a little shove is all it takes to provoke a fight. With such protective instincts over the females, scuffles like this are commonplace. When the fighting's over, it's time for some tenderness. The male and female intertwine tentacles. While in this tight embrace, he uses a specialized arm to pass a packet of sperm into an opening in her mouth fertilising her eggs. And now it's her turn to get to work. She lays her eggs individually, filling the membranes with ink, creating little bunches of jet black orbs known as sea grapes. Occasionally though, Eggs are laid completely transparent. It makes them more vulnerable, but does allow us a wonderful window into the developing cuttlefish. Just over a month later, it's time for these tiny babies to leave the safety of their eggs. They may be less than a centimetre long, but they emerge with a bounty of honed hunting skills. They can flash colours to hypnotise their prey, mimic swaying seaweed to go unnoticed, and when the moment is right, they strike, ten times faster than the blink of an eye. In a split second, they shoot out feeding tentacles, seizing their prey and reeling it into their razor-sharp beak. With just a two-year lifespan, these little cuttlefish will need all the shrimp they can eat. They can reach half a metre in length as adults and will soon have to make the long journey out to the depths of the English Channel. As for their parents, their two-year-long lives are over shortly after mating, leaving young cuttlefish to make their own way out into the deep. What a lovely film. I do like a cuttlefish. And you know what, as I get older, I'm building up kind of like a bucket list of things I really want to see. Stag beetle is up there, never seen one of those. And another one that's on there is diving with cuttlefish when they're mating and watching that subtle change of colour back and forth. They're brilliant things, they really are. And one bird that's on many people's bucket list is the hen harrier. And this is where I'm really lucky because every year I get to help monitor a small population in Wales. And here on Mull, we're very lucky too, because there's plenty of vole-rich moorland, ideal habitat for the 40 or so pairs that nest here. 
And in winter watch, I went out to see a communal roost where several hen harriers come in and roost in the tall vegetation close together. Now, of course, it's the breeding season and the first egg is laid here on Mull roughly end of April, maybe early May, but even before egg laying, the male usually indulges in one of the most spectacular displays in the whole of the avian world. It's called the sky dance. And this is the sky dance. A male hen harrier flying up towards the heavens. As it reaches the peak, it tips over on its back and then tips back again, flapping constantly up and down and up and down, time and time again, like a big dipper. It is spectacular. And the male is doing this for several reasons. First of all, to advertise a territory. This is where he's hoping to breed. So he's telling other males, keep away. This is my patch. Also for the females, if he hasn't attracted a female, a passing female will see that from miles away, will be drawn in. If he's already got a female, she's going to be looking up and thinking, wow, I want to stick with this male here. And for me, this is a sign of spring. When I go up onto the Welsh moors in late April and I see my first sky dancing male hen harrier, I know spring has arrived even up there on the Welsh moors. It is fantastic. And our cameraman who was out there filming that also filmed something pretty spectacular. Look at this. Something I've only seen maybe half a dozen times in all my years of monitoring. A male coming around. The female is on the floor and she's sending messages to him that she is now ready to mate. So the male comes over, lands on the female, and they mate. And they will mate several times now, leading up to egg laying. And you know, in all my years, I've seen that maybe six or seven times, that's all. So the cameraman, very lucky man, right place at the right time. So they've mated. Next, of course, comes egg laying. She lay anything between three and six, three and seven eggs on the floor. And she is the only one who will incubate those eggs. She's dark. So she's perfectly camouflaged. She'll blend in with all of that vegetation. His job is to feed her. And to do that, they indulge in even more aerial acrobatics, the food pass. Here's a male coming in with a vole here, whistles the female up. He then climbs slowly, stalls, drops the prey, and she grabs it with those long legs of us. Let's have a look at that again with another pair. Here he comes with prey, whistles her up, climbs up, stalls, she comes up, drops the prey. Those legs then dash out and grab the prey there. And that will carry on from even before egg laying, right through egg laying, right through until the chicks are fairly old. It's only when there's old chicks in the nest that the male will eventually fly over the nest and start dropping in food because the female has to go off and hunt for herself then. So if you see a food pass like that, you know you're in a hen harrier's territory then. Now one of the obvious things there was the difference between those two birds. They're very, very different. The female, of course, is a large brown bird and this is called sexual dimorphism. So different, actually, with the harriers that it's called extreme sexual dimorphism. So look at the female. Big bird. She's a big bird. Long-winged, long-tailed. And that barring on the tail gives her one of her other names, a ring tail. She'll weigh on average about 530 grams. That's 200 grams heavier than the male. So she's a third bigger than the male. Big bird. See that flapping coming towards you there? Then the male is very different. So different, in fact, that in the early years, some ornithologists considered these two to be separate species. Very pale bird with those black wing tips and back to the female landing there. Do you know what? I have now been watching hen harriers in Wales for 50 years, 50 years this year, and I never ever get fed up of lying back in the heather and just watching these birds time and time and time again. They are fabulous birds. And Chris McKillar, now Chris, I know 
One of your favourite birds is the male sparrowhawk. And yes, fair enough, he's a little stunner. But for me, it has to be the male hen harrier every time. It would be quite a strong argument to place Sparrowhawk over Hen Harrier. They're both absolutely exquisite birds, Yolo, no doubt about that. But one thing, listening to you speaking there, that made me think was that how geography, you know, affects our abilities and interests as naturalists. You've never seen a stag beetle. I see them all the time because I grew up in the south of England. I have never seen some of that Hen Harrier behaviour mm -hmm. that you have because I just don't simply see them breeding. I only see them in the wintertime. But it's a treat to see that. Thank you. Now, we've moved over to the woodland at this point in time because we want to focus on some of that behaviour that we saw last night. We were very privileged to show you some of Kate McRae's badgers. She built an artificial set. Yeah, and we saw stuff that's never been seen or filmed before on the watches. It was the birth of some badgers. It's so special, we're going to show it to you again. Look at that. It's the sound, isn't it, that's so extraordinary. Absolutely delightful to see. We also saw Peggy, the mum, covering the badgers up, the little cubs, when she went out. And then we saw her licking their bottoms, which stimulates them going to the toilet. They're absolutely tiny, those badgers, when they're first born. So we thought we'd show you. This is a life-size badger, that's Peggy. That's the cub when it was first born. It's 130 grams, which is about the size of a tangerine. That's that one. And then when it was having, well, when they were all having their little bottoms licked, it was this size, so it's 12 days old. That's the size of two oranges. And then uh, we're going to catch up with them now. They're a little bit older. <laughs> They're three to four weeks. You can see a lot bigger. They're 700 grams now, which is the size of five oranges. There we go. So we've got a tangerine, two oranges, five oranges. I know I never really thought of badgers in terms of sort of citrus fruits before, <laughs> if I'm fairly honest with you. It's a pretty weird diagram as well. There badgers floating in the blackness but, of space. But not only have they they're grown so much, look, when they get to this age, you really get that distinctive badger stripe, don't you? Fantastic. You know, that's making me think. In space, you can't hear badgers scream. No, that's a bit bizarre. That's really bizarre. What? Moving swiftly <laughs> on. Moving swiftly on. Kate has had an extraordinary opportunity to look at the badger behaviour, which is so infrequently seen, of course, as it's hidden below ground in total darkness. And one of the things that she noted was that when the female, Peggy, first started to leave her young, she would only do so for about 20 minutes in 24 hours, not giving her much time to replenish her reserves after the energetically exhaustive process of giving birth. But when they got to this age, she was leaving them for a longer period. She was going out for about an hour every night looking for food, emerging as they do. And first thing a badger does when it comes above ground, it has a scratch. Go on, you know you want it. <laughs> there we are. I love the sound of that. Meanwhile, below ground, the youngsters are sort of cuddling up to one another to stay warm, but she's straight back in as soon as she's had enough food, of course, because, as we mentioned last night, infanticide, killing of those cubs by typically a male of either that social group or another social group is something that's always on the cards and she has to guard against it. So you can imagine those two cubs are in that nest, it gets pretty messy. And this is what Kate recorded when they were four weeks old. She recorded the mother cleaning the nest. And how she does this is she takes the cubs out, look at how she's carrying them in her mouth, carries them from one chamber to another. Now Kate doesn't have a camera in the second chamber, so we, we can't see that, but she left them there. Then she'd come out, she'd take the dirty nesting material out, drag some new stuff down, and obviously that gets rid of any parasites, it's better for incubation. It's basically like, you know, cleaning a duvet cover, putting a new duvet cover on and it's all fresh. And then she brings those cubs back in. It's just the noise, it's relentless, isn't it, Chris? Mm. Mm. Just carries and on And you'd never know, would you? Uh, never know, I've never, never heard a badger making that on. sound in all of my living life. Because it is underground. Again, you can see that stripe. It's really quite distinctive now. She goes into the nest, starts cleaning them, and then, as you'd expect, starts no. suckling. No. Oh, hold it, hold it back. come Don't do on. It. I love the way you can see her breathing and they fall asleep. I remember that when my son was a baby, fell asleep as I was feeding. Oh, it's just the most delightful shot. 
Oh, come on, it warms the heart. It is. Let uh, it warm it, your heart, Chris. <laughs> it's warmed my heart. It's extraordinary to be able to see this. And, of course, we'll bring you some more of it tomorrow. But it's now time to take a break. It's our mindfulness moment. Now, take a look at this cameo from a place that's very close to my heart, frequently warms my heart, <laughs> the New Forest in Hampshire. The sylvan idyll that is the new forest. It's Absolutely stunning. And some very special species, as you saw there. Red star, spotted flycatcher, what a place. Did you spot your house? <laughs> in there somewhere, isn't it? Let's have a look at some of the things that you've sent in. Have a guess what this is, Chris. I really like this. The colours are amazing. Sent in by Simon Marsh. Any guesses? It's a pigeon, isn't it? It's a pigeon's Beautiful. mate. Beautiful. I mean, I would put that up on the wall. I love that green and purple and okay. white. D. Butler sent us this and said, can you tell us what it is? Well, it's back to Caterpillar Identification Club, isn't it? And this, D, I can tell you, is the caterpillar of the mullein moth. It feeds on greater mullein, and the adult moth, I have to say, is nowhere near as splendid as the caterpillar. It's dull and brown and spends its winter, or several winters, underground before it emerges. Keep sending your questions and your photos in. But for now, that's all we've got time for. We'll be back tomorrow at 8 o'clock. Lots to come, of course, including this. We will be uncovering the secret lives of unexpected serpents in North Wales. Which species of serpent? Escalapian. What a name. Excellent. <laughs> I'll be visiting the wonderful Coquit Island and seeing a beautiful seabird sanctuary. I'll be bringing you a mull first, the checkered skipper. Excellent stuff, and remember that you can keep your eyes peeled on our cameras from noon until 9.30, following the activities of things like those black caps, which are quite entertaining. Herons are still there. Hannah Stitford will be back on social media tomorrow at one o'clock with a very special guest. Gemma Collins will be joining us. I'll be giving us some wildlife gardening tips. And after that, you can join us at eight o'clock tomorrow night on BBC Two. I can't promise you a world first, but I can promise you a lot more great wildlife action. Good night. See you tomorrow. To find out more about uncovering urban wildlife and about how regenerative farming affects our countryside, go to bbc.co.uk forward slash springwatch and follow the links to the Open University.